Here's a new queen. Should I replace her this year or let her go through the winter? And according to my record, here is a three-year-old queen. There's no way I can take her through the winter. But her brood pattern, it looks really good. Hey everybody, David Burns. Thanks for joining me here on my YouTube channel. Happy Sunday to you. I'm glad to be back with you on another video talking today about replacing your queen. And at the end of this video, coffee time. Looking forward to spending some time with you. But today, let's talk about when we should replace our queen because it is a hot topic for discussion today. And right off the bat, I'm gonna let you know that it is imperative that you consider replacing your queens. I'm gonna give you the dangers of not replacing your queen. I'm gonna give you the benefits of replacing your queen. And I'm gonna tell you the magic month when you are most beneficially um, benefit from replacing your queen. It's gonna be the month of July. So let's talk about whether or not it's that important to replace your queen. Let's jump right into it first of all and say, what are the dangers of not replacing your queen? Well, look, here's how, it, here's how it comes down for me. When I go out there in the spring and I have a nice size overwintered colony and I have to decide, okay, got to make a split. And you know, my traditional way, common way of making splits for me is to pull out about five frames of brood and resources along with the queen that overwintered. Now she's probably a two-year-old queen, right? This is gonna be her second year or maybe her third year. So I'm making a split with the older queen. I don't want them to swarm with the older queen. So I take her away and I make a split. They become an established colony. The colony back home that overwintered makes a new queen and that's a brand new queen for them. A, in this case, a 2023 queen. The hive that I walk away with, the split, it's got maybe a 2020 or a 2021 or a 2022 queen in it. Anyway, it's an older queen. So I don't have to worry about the queen that they raised this year. That queen is gonna be fine for me. It's a one year old queen. I don't really mind overwintering with a brand new queen for that season, letting her go through the winter. But the hives that I split, they have older queens in them, one to two year old queens. I'm not comfortable overwintering with queens that are two years old or older. Let me tell you why. For me, the issue is you don't always know how long they are gonna keep laying really well. So in other words, you may make a split or maybe this is your second year to, for your queen or your third year for that queen and the brood looks outstanding. Solid brood pattern, you just love it. Oh my gosh, I love this queen. She's marked, I can find her easy, and I see all this brood, solid brood pattern. I'm gonna go through winter with this one more year. The risk or the danger of that is, see, this is how it comes down. Queens actually store all the sperm from that one single mating flight in their spermatheca. Now, the risk is how many drones did they mate with? How much sperm did they store in their spermatheca? because it eventually runs out. They disperse it by fertilizing the eggs. And so as they use up the stored sperm in their spermatheca, it simply runs out. So even though she's laying a great brood pattern now, fertilized eggs, worker bees coming along, she is losing sperm count. Every time that she fertilizes eggs, the spermatheca, she's not reproducing that sperm. It's stored. So it is running out. So after two to three years, you're at risk of her going through the winter and the first good amount of weather that hits in the spring and she wants to start laying fertilized eggs, she can't because during the winter, she ran out of sperm. And so she starts laying unfertilized eggs, which are drone eggs, and uh-oh, you're in danger now of losing that colony because number one, it's late winter, early spring when she wants to start laying and no queens are available. Number two, if they were available, probably too cold to ship them. And number three, most queen producers are sending their queens into packages and nucleuses in the spring 
because you can get more money selling a, a package with a mated queen or a nucleus with a mated queen than you can selling one mated queen. So it's gonna be hard for you to replace that queen early in the spring. So you always wanna uh, throw out some insurance so that when you come out of winter, you know you have a solid rocking queen in that hive. Another reason there, it's a little bit dangerous too is because if you come out of winter with a two, three-year-old queen, it's a known fact that the queen mandibular pheromone weakens as the queen gets older. The pheromones that kind of glues the hive together, maybe even keeps them from swarming so much, is that it gets weaker. That's one of the measurements the queen uses to determine if they need to swarm, is the queen mandibular pheromones making its circulation through the hive coming back to the queen to be measured. And the weaker that signal is coming back to the queen, it prompts a swarm. So you can imagine if you have an old queen, the QMP, queen mandibular pheromone is weakening and it's not getting back to her strong, then it means they are, it is gonna prompt a swarm even though they may not need to. So in this case, if you can overwinter with a strong queen that has strong queen mandibular pheromone, it may actually reduce swarming in the following spring. So my go-to reasoning behind all of this is I can't risk losing a queen in the winter. I can't risk her running out of stored sperm in the winter time. And I can't risk a low queen mandibular pheromone prompting swarms in the spring, those three problems, those three dangers are easy for me to, to solve with a new queen, dropping a new queen in there. So those are the dangers. Now, why is July the best month to replace your queen? It has long been known that after the summer solstice, which is around June the 20th, 21st, that's about the time you want to replace your queen. And the reason behind that is, it's because when you uh, put a new queen in there, late June or in July, that queen actually is ready to start laying because in, in all intents and purposes for her, it's spring, she's a new queen. She's like a, 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 a spring queen. So she likes to lay a lot of brood. What you want, everybody listen, I'm pumped and excited about this. What she wants and what the hive needs is a lot of brood because you want to start raising brood of winter physiology or what I call dearth physiology. Bees that live four to six months. So if you have an old queen that you're relying on raising that brood, and all of a she's not laying well in the fall, it's hard to get a queen. And so you need to make sure that you replace this queen that you've had that's done a good job. Put a new queen in there after the summer solstice in the month of July so that she can be the mother. The rapid reproduction of all this brood is going to just be the bees of winter physiology. You don't have to worry about not getting enough winter bees. So that's the essential time period is the month of July. So now's the time to do it. Am I wanting you to panic? Am I wanting you to run out and try so hard to get a new queen in the month of July? Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's panic. Let's do it. And I say that based on my years of experience. I'm not selling queens this year, so I'm not trying to get you to buy my queens. Buy them from a reputable uh, place that has a good reputation. But for me personally, I've been caught too many times with my pants down. That's an awkward term. Because my queen failed during the, the fall or during the early spring, and I had no way to replace her and the hive perished. And so that's why I say, probably a good idea to panic. Now, earlier in the video, I started off by saying, look, here's a brand new queen for 2023. She was brand new for this season. Maybe you got her in a package. Maybe you got her in a nucleus. Maybe um, you, know, you replaced the queen and got a new queen this year, a brand new queen. Do you need to replace those 2023, those, the, and if you're watching this video later, do you have to replace the queen the same year you got her? No, I don't think so. I, I don't feel that I need to. Like I said, if I made a split and they raised their own queen this year, I don't replace that queen. But on the split that I walked away with, it's gonna be year two or three for her, absolutely. I can't trust her. That I've had too many failures. 
So I need to go into winter with queens that are this year's queens. Wow, that's that's outstanding in it. Uh, this is good stuff. I mean, I've got I've I've given you the dangers and I've given you the benefits. If you didn't hear all the benefits of the queen mandibular pheromone, then you need to go back and listen to that again in this video. Now I've got one more thing I want to share with you before I do though. Look at we got Bobblehead David here with us today. <laughs> Bobblehead David is promoting uh subscribing to this video. Why it's so important for you to subscribe is if you click on the bell, you can be notified each time I make new video like this one that's gonna help you out, make fewer beekeeping mistakes and keep healthier bees. So all of this comes down to right now, a critical time in July when we need to requeen. Again, requeen queens that are two to three years old, you, it's too risky to go through winter with them. Why is it important to do it now? Why am I making this video for you guys? Because your queen could fail in August or September, even before winter hits. And you may rapidly try to call people up and say, hey, do you have any queens available? Most of the places are gonna tell you they're sold out for the year or they're done making queens and you won't be able to find a queen. In July, there are still people, still reputable beekeeping companies and places that are still selling very good queens. Queens that are raised later in the year when they're able to mate with more drones on a mating flight are much better queens anyway. And so right now, this is a time that you can get queens. So in other words, if you try to replace a queen or if you have a failing queen in the month of July, you can work it out. You can uh, put a new queen in there. And so this is an important critical time for you right now to take advantage of July and replace the queen. Now, before you leave a comment, David, where do you suggest I buy a queen? Do you sell queens, David? No, I'm not selling queens this year. Well, David, who do you recommend makes the best queen? Where am I gonna get the best queen from? That's up to you to decide. I'm not gonna make any recommendations. Now, David, should I get a Carniolan? Should I get a Caucasian? Should I get an Italian? Should I get a Russian? Should I get the ankle biters? Should I get Saskatchewan? What should I get? Wh which one should I get? Which one's better? Look, I'm gonna be honest with you. Here's the deal. It's haploid diploidy genetics. We haven't really come up with a queen that solves all of our problems. People are working on it. We have a long way to go. We have years to go. You're not gonna be able to find a queen that will produce outstanding honey, resist all diseases, and have no mites, go on and go, go forth with all these concepts. It doesn't exist. You'll hear those claims, don't, don't fall for them, because it's really up to you as a beekeeper. Now, there are some people that are working on uh, developing queens that are a little more resistant and, and helpful in controlling mites that, that her progeny is. But again, you can't buy a queen that is gonna be mite resistant and not check mites and not uh, treat for mites because there's no queens out there that are 100% mite resistant. They help, some, some breeds will help, but it's not 100% yet. So you still have to do the same thing. You still have to test for mites, you still have to treat for mites. You may not have to treat as much. You may, have, may not have to treat with uh, some bigger chemicals. You might be able to control it more with some low level IPM methods that are more mechanical methods like green drone comb, breaking the queen's brood cycle, more preventative methods. But yeah, you still gotta deal with mites. So, don't really get on the bandwagon just yet of thinking you can buy a magical silver bullet queen. If it was out there, we'd only be buying queens from that company or that individual and all of our mite troubles would be over. Mite troubles are bigger and worse than they've ever been. So we're not able to solve problems with queens just yet. We're making headways and yes, some people are producing queens that are more resistant to control mites a little bit, and that's beneficial, believe me. If you can do that, you should do it. But don't, don't give up all your other methods of testing and controlling mites just because you think the queen's gonna do it all for you and her offspring because we're not there yet. <laughs> Sunday is a good time for me to do coffee time and it's related to beekeeping, generally speaking. I usually tie beekeeping in with some life lesson and I love you guys and I appreciate you joining me for coffee time. I think there's five of you now that enjoy coffee time. By the way, if you enjoy coffee time, 
it, I need to know. So leave a comment down below and say, yes, I'll eat, I love coffee time. If you don't like coffee time and you hate it, don't leave a comment below and tell me you hate it. That's just gonna make me cry, not make, make me wanna make any more videos. <laughs> just let me know if you like it and you enjoy it, and then I'll think, I think I'll do more coffee time. So, you know, I thought about doing a coffee time like once a week at the end of beekeeping videos. So if you don't like coffee time, you love my beekeeping videos, but you don't like coffee time, you just have to stop watching when coffee time starts. If you love coffee time, you can keep watching. That's how things work. I'm not forcing you to watch coffee time, but I enjoy talking to you guys about stuff that's sometimes not related to beekeeping and I love coffee and I'm going to continue to show you guys how I make coffee because you know what I started making pour over coffee I like pour over coffee a lot most of you have seen my videos in the past where I show you how I make I roast my own green beans that's a funny story there and I roast my green coffee beans I grind my own coffee beans and Sherry and I always love starting our day off with a cup of freshly ground uh, Jurgen Shelf coffee. I love that a lot. And by the way, we sell these coffee mugs. If you'd like to get a coffee mug with my mug on it and have coffee with me, some of the scenes of different YouTube videos that I've made, uh, these are available. I'll leave a link in the description below. But today I want to tell you about my uh, journey in being a videographer. Now, I don't really view myself as a videographer. I kind of don't think that I, I really don't make video movies, for example, but in a sense, I do. About three or four times a week, I plan a video. I do a storyboard. I, sometimes I do some scripting out of things I want to say. And I create videos just for you guys. I don't just blindly step in front of a camera and say to myself, okay, what do I say now? What, do I, what, do I, what should I do a video on? I plan my videos out months in advance. I know I don't seem like it. I know it doesn't seem like I'm capable of doing that, <laughs> but I do. I have several books that, that I use like this where they, they hold all my video ideas. Like today's video is all kind of, you know, scripted out, planned out. I've already planned out my thumbnail, my title, and all those things uh, weeks ahead of time. Um, generally for me, when I make a video on, on, on a beekeeping uh, video, I actually first design the thumbnail, and then I design the title of my video, and then I build my video around the thumbnail and the title or the subject. And that's important for me to do that. So I, I've got some uh, plans behind what I do. But what I want to share with you on coffee time today is that when I was a teenager, barely a teenager, maybe I was 13 or 14. Well, let me back all the way up. When I was a kid, I loved photography. Hey, leave a comment below if you remember those first cameras that we used back in the 60s and 70s. It was like a Kodak Instamatic camera and it had that little cartridge of film that you put in the back. I don't remember exactly what it's called. Was it a 125? Maybe that was my Honda that I had. I had a little Honda 125, <laughs> but I also had a little Kodak Instant, Insta something, Kodak camera. Here's the deal, this is so funny. Well, when you use this Kodak camera and you, I don't know how many pictures you could take, 15, 20 maybe, and you would crank it, you would snap and you, and you take another one, right? And then look, I would get a little order form out of my mom's uh, Women's Day magazine or something in the back. You'd tear it out, a Kodak order thing, envelope. You would actually take that cartridge out when it's all done, put it in there and throw in some cash, whatever they said it costs, and send it to the US post office <laughs> by mail to Kodak in Chicago. And then you would sit around, I don't know, a week, a month to get your pictures back. Here's the funny thing. You would get your pictures back and we all knew that out of like 15 shots that you took, probably five to 10 were trash. They were at the front of the roll and so the exposure was over, over bright, it was too bright. Or, you know, many of them had our fingers blocking the lens <laughs> and it was just like so many of those pictures were ruined but you'd have like a handful that were pictures and it was like oh good i got some cool shots here so i was doing that as a very young person but even younger than that my dad had an eight millimeter camera he did he had an eight millimeter movie camera and 
I don't remember the name brand, it started with an H, Hal maybe? But it had these big floodlights on a bar that, that just glowed. You know, he would take Christmas pictures of up, opening our presents up in the 60s and that thing would be running and those lights, we couldn't even open our eyes up. All the cool videos that he took uh, of us on that eight millimeter film camera, our eyes are closed. We're like, ah! <laughs> and then as I got a little bit older, a few years older, early teens, I grabbed that camera that he had and I bought a splicer. That was the video editor that I used back then. Glue and a splicer. Leave a comment below if you know what in the world I'm talking about. You could actually roll it through the editor. It was like a little screen that shined through the film and then you, you could see it and you could roll it. And if you wanted to add or splice, you could cut it and then take scenes out or put scenes in and glue them together. I love doing that. I, I sat there and made videos as a very young kid. I made cowboy movies. <laughs> I dressed up like a cowboy. I had those little fake um, cap guns, pop, pop. And I had hosters and stuff, cowboy hat made silly little stuff as a kid with my little eight millimeter splicer. I don't even think it had sound on it. And then I started doing more complicated stuff. Like uh, I was actually filming uh, clouds uh, going by and I would go out there and just trip the shutter, the button to activate the video camera or the eight millimeter camera just for a minute, uh, just for a second. And I would just do that for like an hour. And then when I played it back, you could actually see the, the clouds go by really fast. Isn't that amazing? It was so much fun. Well, as I got older, I kept doing all of this camera stuff. I even had my own dark room. That's right. I had, oh, here's what I want to tell you guys about my dad. Um, I don't know. I think I've shared this before, but maybe some of you haven't heard it. But as when I was a, a young teenager, I wanted a very expensive uh, 135, 135 millimeter camera back then. Ooh, Fuji, Fuji maybe? It was just like, I would read all the camera magazines and this camera was to die for. It was a steel shot, wasn't video back then. But just, uh, I wanted to take black and white pictures, you know, and I had my own dark room. And so my dad said, that's an expensive camera. I think it was like $250 back in the late 60s, which was like $1,000 today probably or more. But my mom and dad, you know, they, they, they were hard workers, but we didn't have a lot of money. We weren't deathly poor, but we just didn't have that kind of money to throw on a camera. So, but one time my dad, where he worked, he got a big bonus that year. He came home and said, I got X amount of dollars as a bonus. I was like, wow, that's great. And he said this, David, we're going to go over to Terre Haute, Indiana, and we're going to go buy that camera you're wanting for 250 bucks. I'm like, oh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that's just like unbelievable. I'm like, really? Are you serious? Yes. Wow, isn't that great? My dad, my mom and dad, we drove over to Terre Haute to a camera shop, probably still there today, I don't know. And um, I bought that camera and all I could do was take pictures. I mean, it was just awesome. I, I, I just love photography. I had my own dark room. In high school, uh, one of the classes I, I signed up for that you could take, an elective, I think, was photography. And you could learn how to run your own darkroom. Heck, I was already doing darkroom. I, was, I already had pictures in the newspaper. I was submitting to the local newspaper. But the teacher of the, of the class, he immediately saw that I knew all about darkroom exposures and everything. He put me in charge of running the darkroom. Right off the, I was a teenager in high school running a darkroom for a photography class because he just said, show them what to do. I'll, I'll do the other stuff. You do the dark room. <laughs> that was a hooch, you know? And I just think back to that day, my dad uh, bought that camera for me. Things were different with parents buying stuff for their kids back then. Today, uh, kids get a lot. Wow. But back then, you know, shoot, Christmas was special because you didn't get much during the year. And then Christmas, you've got a few toys or something. But to get something in the middle of the year like that was just, uh, it was unbelievable. But as time progressed, I stayed in photography. And then as I got, you know, I started buying video cameras when they became available, cheap ones. And I just had a hoot. 
This whole idea of beekeeping on YouTube, and by the way, I think I'm the oldest, longest running beekeeping channel on YouTube, um, but I just started vlogging about my beekeeping experience. I would just make videos of what I was doing in the bee yard. And they're still on there. The very first video I ever made, you can go back and watch me when I was very young. See how much older I've gotten now, but you can go back and watch those early videos. It's not that I had a bad camera. YouTube wouldn't let you upload high quality, uh, you know, <laughs> video back then. So uh, that's just the way it was. But I started posting beekeeping videos and you know, a lot of people think that my channel is real successful. I know what I'm doing and everything. Look, here, here's how, this is the coffee time. Let me take a sip of coffee. Mm. What I want to tell you about coffee time is success rarely, if never, is overnight. A lot of people think that. A lot of people think overnight success. Nah, that, I don't think so. Overnight success is um, not really ever a thing because uh, if you think that my channel is, I've, I thank you guys for being the audience that watches these. I do have 101, 121,000 subscribers, which is a large beekeeping channel. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I don't, I'm humble. I, take, I don't take that for granted, but I didn't get there overnight. I started in 2008. I've been doing this, what, 15 years? 15 years, a decade and a half of just putting one foot in front of the other and making a video. When I didn't want to, when I was sick, when I didn't feel good, when I was poor, when I had problems going on in my life. I didn't show you my problems on the video, but I was under a lot of stress, having a lot of problems. I just made another video. I just put one foot in front of the other. Success is not something that happens instantly. It's a process of just doing things over and over with consistency. That means a lot. That means a lot to me to think back and say, I'm glad I didn't have overnight success. Um, there are some people that actually copy um, some of my videos that I do. They'll make a video just like mine. I don't care. I mean, they're wanting to get established. They think I know something. They think they can make a video like I made and get the same views that I have. And hey, you know, that's fine. It's a free world, do what you want. But I, I, I know for a fact that if you can be yourself, and that's what I've always tried to do on YouTube, is just be myself, be me. If you don't like me, you don't have to watch my channel. I'm not making you watch me. If you don't like my style, you don't like my personality, good. I mean, you go somewhere else, right? That's the way we are. But if you like me, if you enjoy listening to me, hey, you subscribe. You're part of my Beak Squad community. We have a good time together. That's the world we live in. That's cool. But that's, I think that if anything, my success, if you want to call it that, has only been because I've just been consistently making videos and being myself. That's pretty cool. And so let's talk about you now. Enough about me. You have a lot going for you because you are you and you are very unique. I talk to a lot of people sometimes when they ask me, believe it or not, a lot of people say, hey, I know you're successful on YouTube. I want to start a cooking channel, a bicycle channel, a, a mower, how to mow your yard channel. What do I do? How do I get your level of success? And so uh, first thing I say is, man, you can do it. You got the right personality. You got the right kind of face. And that doesn't mean it has to be a good one or you have to be a movie star. It just means that you have to be yourself. And if people love watching people who are themselves, I think that's why all of you guys enjoyed so much watching the, the video I made of the lavender farmer. He was so good in front of a camera. He was just himself. And, and people feel good when you can be yourself. We like talk, we like listening to people talk, share their stories. Everybody has a story. You have a story. You could be 79, 89, or 99 years old, or 19, or nine, and you have the potential to, to really be something um, impactful on YouTube. Look, are you gonna get on YouTube and become the next Mr. Beast? Nah, probably not. I mean, you could, but probably not. But you want to have a YouTube channel. I have grandchildren that want to be on YouTube like I am. And I'm careful to tell them, you know, why do you want to be on YouTube? I want to make money. I want to have a yacht. I want to drive a limousine. I have a limousine. 
Mm, that's not a good reason to be on YouTube. I feel that you should be on YouTube in order to help others. That's right. Use your personality, your talent, your skills to help other people. That's when you get the most satisfaction, you know. Um, it's not all about money. You want to make money to pay your bills, make a living, get by in life. But I don't know if you really want to try to be a celebrity on YouTube because a lot of stuff comes with that that you may not enjoy. <laughs> but my point is, you, I'm not telling you to be a YouTube personality. It may be some other field, but whatever you do in life, figure out a way to right now say, I'm me, I have talents and I have skills of some level, and I need to use those to help other people. Some of you work in fields where you help other people every day. Maybe you're a doctor, you're a nurse, uh, first responder, maybe you're in the military defending our country, thank you for your service. You know, maybe you're a police officer uh, working hard to keep communities safe. That's great. All that is so admirable, noble. With that comes a lot of pressure that you're always putting yourself second. You're always putting others above yourself. And you can do that for a little while. You can do that for a while. You can make a career out of that. But let me just put out a word of caution. There's going to come a point of time, a time in, in, in your career, that you need to put yourself first. You can't always live a life of total surrender and never thinking about yourself because you'll become unhealthy mentally or physically. And so you always need to balance that. It's good to help others. I make YouTube videos to help beekeepers. I also go on bike rides. I also spend time just relaxing. There are days I don't make videos because I need to take a breather and relax. You know what I mean? So if you're in that field right now, uh, you're, maybe you're a, a, a nurse and you're, you're working 12 hour shifts, you know, you got to find a, a way for you to put yourself first. So I know firsthand because I have three sons and three daughters. I know my daughters, they all have children. My, I've, I've raised a family of six children, my wife and I, Sherry, and that can be extremely stressful where a mom can never put herself first. You know what I mean? You're just like, got to put my kids first. I got to put my husband first. I got I to gotta keep the family going. I got to get all these things done. Yes, but please, it, it's okay to put yourself first. You're not being selfish. You're not being, uh, you know, greedy. Don't feel bad about taking time for you. But if you really want to be an overnight success, you are going to have to put the time in and you are going to have to uh, I tell people I'm a 15 year overnight YouTube success. <laughs> My overnight period was 15 years because from 2008 until about 2019, my channel wasn't that big of a deal. But about 2019, about a year before COVID, uh, the channel got traction. So if you are interested in being uh, someone who enjoys making videos on YouTube, do it to help people and put one foot in the other, front of the other, for a lot of years before you expect to gain any traction. Even if you start a business, they say you should, you're, you're not going to make a profit for five years. You know what I mean? Anything you do, you got to put the time in. I know that's not always what you want to hear. Maybe you bought a coffee shop, you're starting a new coffee shop. Maybe you bought a, maybe you're turning uh, one of your properties into a, bed and breakfast, you know, maybe you're, you know, whatever, just, just realize that it's going to take time. Uh, let's get out of our minds that things happen overnight. They don't. <laughs> All right. That's a good coffee time today. Hey guys, I got a great video. I want you to watch if you haven't seen this video yet. It's everything that you should be doing in the month of July. We've got a few weeks left. I don't want you to drop the ball. This is when you need to pick up the pace, get it done. Cowboy up. I'll see you over here what you should be doing in the month of July. See you guys.